what have you come to speak to the KAUST community about? Yes, no, thank you for inviting me. It's mm -hmm. a real pleasure uh, to be here at KAUST. It's yeah. my first time yeah. in Jeddah as well as KAUST. Okay. Um, uh, so far, I'm very pleasantly surprised yeah. uh, in, in so many ways. Um, thank you. Uh, my f presentation is going to focus on personalized medicine. Right. And I'll look at explore opportunities and challenges in relation to personalized medicine. I will um, focus on personalized medicine, but also personalized health. Okay. The, the transition, the, and this is where the opportunities come from focusing on a, a highly targeted interventions at uh, gene level to targeted interventions at population level. Okay. So do you see personalized health as uh, simply a larger categorization? So that includes perhaps uh, wellness and, and other things that people are doing? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I see it more, of a, more as a transition mm -hmm. um, and linkage from genes all the way to globe. Okay. Um, so personalized medicine has been conceived uh, as a highly targeted interventions for individuals that have a mutation in in their genetic makeup which then leads to a disease condition mm -hmm. then a targeted intervention is a targeted treatment okay. uh, is then developed to address that but the real of but these these mutations tend to be rare mm -hmm. whereas with large data one can identify uh, anomalies or problems um, at population level right. and stratify populations into groups and then develop highly targeted po policies. And this is where the real opportunity lies. I see. Yeah, for instance, you've um, done a lot of work on tuberculosis and the link between tuberculosis and, and sort of cycles of, of poverty. Um, what what else do you do in your day job as a, a, at Harvard? Yes. Well, my work focuses on health systems okay. broadly. Mm. And when I say health systems, this is health systems at the macro level, okay. how the systems as a whole function. And I use um, a number of indicators or number of tracer conditions to explore how health systems are performing. And as you've uh, correctly identified, tuberculosis has been one of those. Yeah. But I've also used diabetes or hypertension or cancer or mental illness mm -hmm. as tracer or HIV as tracer conditions to, to see how are these conditions manage in health systems, how the health systems respond to these existing or emerging uh, challenges, mm -hmm. where do the problems lie? So, the, so this provides the uh, necessary intelligence to then develop. Uh, policies to address them. Right. You also talk quite a bit about innovation and AI in health systems. So how um, is innovation, and, and in particular, how is AI and big data sort of going to help us improve our health system? Yeah, so I'm going to briefly mention that in my presentation. Mm -hmm. So the, I focus on innovation uh, not just in terms of technology, but also how one can use technology-enabled solutions mm -hmm. uh, or even programs to, to intervene in health systems to address some of the challenges that we've identified. Right. For example, in relation to suboptimal management of conditions mm -hmm. uh, such as tuberculosis, hypertension, or diabetes. Now, what's so exciting now is that we have convergence of many um, developments in different parts of science. Okay. So there, there are developments in relation to um, data, the way we capture data, the way we store data, mm -hmm. the way we're able to integrate data, the way we analyze. So real developments in analytics, mm -hmm. but also our ability to to um, to handle large data sets, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to improvements in computing, and also ability to trans. Um, communicate these. So developments in data science, communication technologies, statistics, um, along with new learnings with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, enables us to uh, identify associations and trends which we've not been able to do before. Right. So, I mean, human mind can only cope with um, so many variables at, at a given time. Right. Whereas with large data, we're able to 
um, with new analytical methods, we can look at associations uh, over time mm -hmm. and then use machine learning to accelerate that process to identify uh, what is associated with a particular variable mm -hmm. and then develop highly targeted solutions. This, this is very, very exciting. Yeah. How do we make sure that um, the benefits of these systems aren't sort of uh, applied or experienced unequally? How do we make sure that it's not a, um, a North American and European Abs phenomenon? Absolutely. It's an excellent question and something I will mention in my presentation again. And there I think we have two challenges. First of all, there are wide, widening gaps and inequalities, I would mm. say, in relation to um, what some better off countries are able to provide for their citizens yeah. compared to countries in low and middle income countries. But actually within that also there are inequalities within countries, huge inequalities, even in a country like the US, yeah. where the, um, the health outcomes are actually very wide and actually where the health outcomes in relation to uh, life expectancy at birth are actually declining. It's, it's gone into reverse exactly. in the last three years in the US. Yeah. So that's, that's one big concern, the inequalities. So who benefits from these technologies? The widening inequalities, will this accelerate the inequality gap? The second big concern is, is um, it's something that we articulated in a paper recently, mm -hmm. uh, algorithmic bias, yeah. which, um, and this is very interesting. This is a paper that was published in the Journal of Global Health, mm. where we looked at um, the, the, the possibility and the real risk, I would say, that the data sets we currently have um, that are not representative of the whole populations and mishad marginalized groups and communities right. and individuals are used to develop policies. Right. And given the capacity of machine learning and AI to augment mm -hmm. analysis will and and um, and and um, and come up with solutions, the big danger is that we'll use these limited data sets to further augment the inequalities that we have precisely so the yeah. algorithmic bias is a huge risk mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed who whose responsibility is it um to tackle these challenges. I know that you've worked with some large international bodies like the World Health Organization, but who ultimately is it that steps in and helps make sure that our data sets represent our ethnic diversity, our gender diversity, et cetera, um, and ensures that these systems help uh, uh, raise global standards, not just, uh, mm. as you said, increase inequality? I think this is everyone's responsibility because mm. these solutions ultimately, these policies affect all of us mm -hmm. um, in some shape or form. But of course, there are different roles and responsibilities for different actors in the system. So for example, uh, at policy level, governments or even um, entities such as the G20, which the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is curr currently the president of, yeah. um, they, they can... Um, signal that this is an important issue that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. and then countries themselves can develop appropriate policies to to regulate and uh, to ensure that algorithmic bias is taken into account yeah. and and entities such as world health organization in relation to health in relation to health could develop some normative guidance what could be done in right. in in different settings but then organizations that deal with data mm -hmm. and that develop algorithms also need to take this into account. But ensuring that A, the data sets they use are, um, are representative and B, they also have representative groups who deal with the data so they really understand what the issues are in relation to these marginalized or, or, right. or missing groups so that the algorithms that are developed uh, reflect this diversity yeah. and they're inclusive and do not further augment the inequalities that exist. Is there a sort of climate change, public health nexus? I, I, I'm not sure that I've heard this spoken about, but it does occur to me that uh, essentially every scientist that we speak with uh, for this program um, has their work, and then they have the climate change thing sort of tacked on. So how 
does public health intersect with um, the global climate change issue? Yes. So, so I think there are two aspects to climate change. So there's the climate change in the way we think. Mm-hmm. I how's the um, uh, how are the views changing? Right. Then there's the climate change in itself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think there's a climate change in the way we think, in that we now are much more aware of the the effects of climate change on the planet and yeah. on health. So there's a strong evidence base. And now, certainly in the last few years, I would say, uh, climate change has moved from being a, an important cons- concern to a crisis. Right. We have to do something now, which is very, very encouraging. Then there's the issue of climate change in itself. Mm. And of course, climate change does affect health. Um, directly and indirectly. Mm-hmm. And for example, um, as a result of climate change, we have uh, we have extremes of weather and these impact on health systems and impact on individuals. And we've been able to demonstrate in a recent study that um, these lead to excess deaths that could be preventable. Yeah. Climate change also leads to um, events that affect countries um, for example, um, through um, in in um, sort of storms and uh, hurricanes, so on and so forth, mm-hmm. and these also have direct effect. But it, they also affect biodiversity, which also affects health directly and indirectly. So yeah. climate change is the number one uh, and the most concerning crisis f- that we face as uh, human beings and actually the planet as a whole. I see. Um, outside of those climate effects, um, how, like, what for you is the next uh, sort of coming public health uh, issue? Um, you had mentioned HIV, and while that's not uh, certainly, we're not out of the woods with that one completely, but we certainly have a much better understanding um, and have some ways to treat and combat it. Um, what what things are coming? Uh, hmm. Do you see that we don't necessarily have? infrastructure and uh, knowledge and, and things? Yes, I think that's a really excellent question. And I want to relate to, to an earlier point that you mentioned in, in in what you were saying, in that people tend to work in their silos. Yeah. Uh, so there are people who work on climate change, there are people who work on HIV, there are people who work on um, um, tuberculosis and AI, so on and so forth. Now, what's changing is that we have multiple factors that mm. are uh, evolving simultaneously. For example, we're undergoing very rapid demographic transition in countries, yeah. which is leading to rapid aging of the population, uh, especially in in low and middle income countries, mm-hmm. where this transition is happening very rapidly uh, and the population is aging very rapidly. That brings a rapid epidemiological transition mm-hmm. with chronic illness, multimorbidity, with cognitive and physical disability in the aging population. We also have rapid change in the socioeconomic norms Mm -hmm. and expectations of citizens uh, in the way they see health and and behave. We also see economic changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Only yesterday, the um, the head of um, IMF predict, well, raised concerns that we may be entering uh, a long period of recession, even yeah. a depression was the word that she used. Right. Then we have environmental changes, climate change. Um, now, then we have political changes, huge polarizations in countries, mm-hmm. uh, as we've seen in the US as well as uh, the UK most recently with uh, with Brexit. Yeah. Now, all of this is all of these changes are happening simultaneously, and they each impact on each other. So we have synergies. Mm-hmm. So we're dealing with very complex systems. Um, and we're dealing with frontiers in, in relation to each of those that w- where we've not really been to. So right. the consequences of these are, are really not known to us. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the big challenge for population health or public health, to identify the consequences of these multiple changes mm-hmm. and then be able to respond rapidly. So we need to develop agile uh, analytical methods as well as agile responses. Mm-hmm. 
what, what does it mean, uh, as you were saying, that some of these populations are aging? So how does that affect the way that public health systems have to respond and uh, make themselves ready to respond? So in, a, so in some upper middle income countries or middle income countries, um, the number of people who are age 65 and, and over mm -hmm. is increasing very rapidly. Yeah. Uh, almost 300 million people in China, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, will soon be over the age of 65. And this has not happened before. Um, and I can count such countries such as Brazil, Philippines, Indonesia, India, mm -hmm. and even uh, countries where there's strong uh, population growth still, such as in Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. there's that aging. Now, what that brings is chronic disease. So. Uh, increased non what we call non communicable diseases such right. as high blood pressure diabetes right. um, uh, ischemic heart disease so on and so forth which account for 70 percent of all deaths okay. now the problem uh. is many of the health systems have not been designed to manage chronic disease and they have not really transitioned mm -hmm. uh, at the same speed as the epidemiological or demographic transition that's happening so as a result we have a huge response gap mm -hmm. and these conditions as I will illustrate in my presentation are very poorly managed in, in health systems mm -hmm. so we have a, a response gap and as a result a very poor management of these conditions leading to a number uh, very large numbers of uh, excess deaths mm -hmm. uh, that could be averted and how do we address that? Uh, what, what are the things that we have to do um, in nations and then as a global community? I think this is where precision health comes into play. So okay. we, can, we can identify uh, a, not just the magnitude of the problem, mm -hmm. uh, but also where these problems tend to lie in health systems. And so one can identify who's at risk um, who's not being diagnosed, who's not being treated, mm -hmm. who's not being up, up, appro appropriately controlled, and who's, uh, as a result, incurring uh, unnecessary or premature deaths. Right. And be when then with that intelligence, we can then develop highly targeted policies, so right. precision policies to target not the population as a whole, but actually at-risk groups right. at every stage of the care continuum so we can uh, we can improve the response at every level of the health system, but across the care continuum. What led you to public health as a as a profession? What uh, what made this your thing, basically? <laughs> well, I realized uh, early on that I'm a physician by background, and I love my prof profession. It's a real privilege um, uh, uh, to be a doctor because one can really make a difference in in one's uh, life and one's circumstance. Mm -hmm. Um, but at policy level, working at health systems, one is able to impact on uh, the lives of many individuals, right. thousands, millions, uh, if the right policies can be can be developed mm. and address the uh, the needs that individuals have. So th that is the, um, the one of the most important motivating factors for transitioning from managing individuals to focusing on management of uh, populations and 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 I, I might say health systems uh, at, at countries right very good well thank you so much for joining us thank really you for the opportunity it.